So I'm going to pass it off to you all. Thank you so much for um, to this program today, and I'm looking forward to hearing. Okay. Thank you, Joy. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, as you can tell, I am a Dodger fan. I've been one uh, all my life. My parents were Dodger fans. Uh, we can get in, you know, to a whole program about the relationship of baseball to the Japanese American community, which goes back uh, when the, the first immigrants came here. But for me personally, uh, when I heard the subject of this particular program in the year 1956, as a Dodger fan, I thought of all uh, how auspicious this year is because uh, I know that in a couple of years, the Dodgers will be moving from Brooklyn. Uh, to Los Angeles. I know that the, that those great Brooklyn teams of the 1950s will be going through a transition in becoming the Los Angeles Dodgers. But the third thing that is happening at that moment is that the, the Los Angeles Dodgers, and in, in particular Walter O'Malley, is thinking in a very broad uh, landscape. And he's looking not just west uh, to uh, Los Angeles, but he's also looking across the Pacific. And this is all embodied by this baseball tour of the Brooklyn Dodgers to Japan in 1956. And the significance of this, I think, is maybe one of those things at the time was not fully understood. But as we all know uh, how Japanese baseball has impacted Major League Baseball, especially in the last 25 years, um, all this begins here to a great extent in 1956. And this is what we're going to ask Mark to talk about. Uh, he's uh, very knowledgeable on all these things. Uh, we're gonna be able to show a few photographs of the tour and, and some of the other things. And then Mark is, is going to give us uh, uh, a, a nice little uh, history of, of this particular tour and what it all meant to baseball. Uh, then and now. So um, maybe we should start with the uh, the first image, you know, of the, the card. And then Mark, maybe you can uh, give us the background of how the Brooklyn Dodgers ended up going to Japan after the 1956 uh, baseball season in which the Dodgers had unfortunately just lost to the Yankees. Absolutely, Chris. It's a pleasure to be with you. And this is really an amazing chapter in the Dodger history. Like you said, nobody knew uh, what was around the corner as far as Los Angeles and baseball moving to the West Coast. And this was the fifth time that a major league team had come to Japan. Uh, first 1931 and 1934 major league all-star teams. And then the San Francisco Seals and Lefty O'Doul came 1949. And then there was an Eddie Lopat all-stars and the uh, New York Giants of 1953 and then the Yankees of 55. And back then, New York had three major league teams. So the Giants had won it in 54, the, Gi the Yankees in 53. And the, as you said, the Dodgers were defending champions in 1955. And so it was natural that they would want to reach out to the world champions and try to get them to come to Japan. And Walter O'Malley had the global vision. He not only wanted to have a bigger ballpark in Brooklyn, but he wanted to have a bigger worldwide audience. And so this was the perfect place to be able to have the Dodger brand in Japan, and it really worked out for several reasons. Nobody knew at the time it was also the last hurrah for the boys of summer. So this was a chance for Jackie Robinson to play out his Dodger career. Uh, people think that when he got the game-winning hit in game six of the 56 World Series, uh, one to nothing to set up a game seven, that that was his last appearance in a Brooklyn Dodger uniform. Actually, he was scheduled to play 20 games in Japan, and so he was able to uh, connect with the Japanese fans and also uh, connect with his teammates and, and really take a breather from everything that he had gone through in the United States and experience a new culture. Rachel Robinson has written in her book that she was just amazed as far as Jackie not only trying the new foods, but being able to uh, just see different parts of the world uh, and just be part of a group, not have to be on stage as Jackie Robinson, but Jackie Robinson and the world champion Brooklyn Dodgers. So, you know, when the Dodgers go and, you know, we see them arriving here in Japan off the, air, uh, off the airplane, and then I think the next picture is them, they're getting a parade, right? They're literally getting a parade, uh, you know, and being welcomed. Um, who was on the other side? Uh, uh, front, uh, who in, in, in the Japan side was actually welcoming them and setting these games up? Well, uh, uh, 
uh, Matsutaro Shiriki was in charge of the uh, Yamare newspaper. He was the founder of not only that newspaper, but was considered uh, the founder of Japanese baseball, professional baseball, as far as being the big organizer. And so Sotaro Suzuki, one of his sports writers, uh, he also was key in international baseball because just imagine he is the one in 1931 that tracked down Babe Ruth in a barber shop in New York and convinced him, hey, you are so popular in Japan, you've got to go there. And by 1934, Babe Ruth was the only player featured on this poster. And so he already had connections uh, in New York. Uh, he had gone to school in the United States. And so those two are really the, uh, really the inspiration behind the scenes in terms of uh, seeing from the Japan point of view how popular the major leaguers could be. And so it was their invitation. And so uh, not only uh, Shiriki, but Suzuki, both those two the whole way, they're really the keys uh, for the next 20 years in terms of the Dodgers and Japanese baseball and, and major league expanding their market to Japan. So, so most of us, you know, who follow uh, baseball, and we certainly know something about Japan, that, you know, Japan's love of baseball is second to none, right? It, it is, uh, they have the, the greatest high school baseball tournament in the world. And, um, and obviously the major league, although it's structured a little bit differently, a lot of the teams are actually sponsored by large corporations, which is why Yomiuri, right? Yomiuri Giants, right? And uh, a lot of the, the baseball teams are actually, uh, they're sponsored Cebu, things like that. So it's a little bit different in terms of the structure. It this is, is a great cover. This yeah, is a great cover. What, what can you tell us about this cover here? Uh, well, this is Don Newcomb at the height of his career, the rookie of the year in 49 and by 1956. He's won 27 games during the regular season and led the Dodgers to the pennant. And he would become the first player to win the Cy Young Award. The first award was given in 1956, and he edged his teammate Sal Magley in the voting. And so Newcomb is the MVP also of the National League. And so he's the biggest star on the trip. And uh, there were other variations of the movie poster, of the, of the travel poster, uh, but this one with Newcomb and Ebbets Field in the background. Uh, and for Dodger fans, you could see in the background, Ebbets Field 1956, that was nostalgic because even though they lost the World Series, that would be the last time that there would be a World Series at Ebbets Field because unbeknownst to the players, the Dodgers had to travel from New York to LAX to Honolulu uh, to... Uh, Wake Island and then oh. to Tokyo. And so wow. they've got like 29 hours of flying. And while they have a layover at LAX, Walter O'Malley meets with LA city officials and just sort of laying the groundwork just in case he couldn't get a deal with Brooklyn. And about a month or two later, he would buy the Los Angeles franchise of the Pacific Coast League. But everybody's thinking they're just going on the way to Japan. And he had a little side business in Los Angeles. And that side business would change the fortune of the franchise two years later. So the other thing about Don Newcomb is he had a long-standing relationship with the Dodgers, right? Um, he, he maintained that the Dodgers maintained that relationship through, you know, even after he stopped playing. Um, he did. He, and, and the interesting thing about Newcomb, he and Larry Doby in 1962, uh, there's a picture in the series that has Duke Snyder posing with a home plate, April the 12th, 1962. Well, later that season, Chunichi representatives thought they wanted to get a couple former major leaguers. So Don Newcomb, who had come to the Dodgers in 1961, trying to make a comeback because they had traded him in 58, and then he had played for uh, the Reds and the Indians. And by 1961, he tried to make a comeback with the Dodgers, and it didn't work out. 1962, he and Larry Doby actually go over to Japan and uh, uh, play ball. Newcomb actually didn't pitch that much. He was a power-hitting first baseman. Newcomb was a great hitter, and uh, he spent the 1962 season in Japan. And then later, you're right, he came back to the Dodgers and helped uh, form Major League Baseball's first community relations department uh, with Peter O'Malley starting in 1969. So uh, Newcomb had originally signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, 1945, along with Roy Campanella and Jackie Robinson, and spent uh, so much time with the Dodger organization in so many different capacities. Yeah, he was great. Now, why don't we go to the next slide, Joy? So this is actually a game, right, in one of the stadiums. Uh, do you know which stadium this is? I don't know which stadium, but my hunch is it's the one in Tokyo, because if you notice to the left, uh, to, uh, to the right, 
if you're sitting in the dugout to the right, you've got these little things called dugout seats. Huh? And when they were planning Dodger Stadium, this was the inspiration for the old dugout seats at Dodger Stadium. So if you're watching the replay of Kurt Gibson's uh, famous World Series home run in 1988, and you see the people behind home plate behind the screen, those dugout seats, which were there until 1999, were actually inspired by the Dodgers' trip to Japan and the Tokyo ballpark had what they called the dugout seats. And in the planning for the stadium, they either called them the Japan seats or the, or the uh, Tokyo or the dugout seats. That was a direct inspiration from the tour in 1956. Wow, that's great. By the way, lucky me, I had happened to go to the Gibson game. Just pure luck. And you didn't leave early? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Greatest single moment in the history of the Los Angeles Dodgers. If so you saw it, live, if you saw it live, you never forget it. Oh God! Yeah, I could. Anyway, we can have a whole program <laughs> about that. Let's go on to the next one. So this is this is Jackie Robinson sliding into. Uh, this is Jackie, and he stole not, he stole home nineteen times during his career, and the statue at Dodger Stadium portrays him uh, sliding it, stealing home, and it's not a specific date because. Uh, Jackie did it 19 times, and if we tried to pin it on a day, then we'd have to make the uniform match the date. So it's just more of a generic celebration, Jackie Robinson number 42, stealing home. Uh, but the interesting thing is Jackie's last hit as a Dodger, his last at bat, he homered, and he actually stole home in Japan uh, wow. during the tour. And so uh, his last home run and his last steal of home actually occurred during the Japan tour. So... Officially, I mean, obviously, you know, the Dodgers trade him, unfortunately, to the Giants, which I don't understand that. But the, the whole thing is he retires after that rather than play. So this, these are really the last games he plays in a Dodger uniform than all the games in Japan. They definitely are. And, and I, I, heard your, I heard your description of that. And just to be clear, uh, we traded him to the Giants for $30,000 and a pitcher named Dick Littlefield. But what we didn't know at the time, he was going to retire, and Look Magazine had the three-part exclusive to Jackie's life story. And so they had paid him for the exclusive story of his retirement. So he actually tells the Giants, I'm not sure if I'm going to play in 1957, but if I do, I'd be happy to play for you. And then when the story comes out, obviously he's retired. And so it makes for a great story. Uh, I'll never play for the Giants and everything like that. And all the Giants, it's a great Dodger, Dodgers, uh, a Giants rivalry story. Uh, but that's not really the case. He actually wrote a nice note to Horace Stoneham, the owner, uh, saying, I've retired to become an executive with chock full of nuts. Uh, so it's not that I don't want to play for you. It's just at this point in my life, uh, I'm done as a ball player and I'm going to be an executive now. Wow. That's, I mean, it's interesting, you know, if the Giants and the Dodgers don't move, right, then, then actually, you know, he wouldn't have had to move out of New York City. I mean, he would have gone to a different borough, right, to go play for the Giants. So it wasn't like he was being traded away like that. Although, as a Dodger fan, I am very happy he never played in a Giants uniform. You just never know. And who knows what would have happened if uh, there, there's so many things. Just imagine you're playing in the World Series in 1956. You're in Japan. Everything's going great great in Brooklyn, and then suddenly it's not there anymore two years later. Uh, all the things that had to happen. Um, but the Japan tour is so important because these seeds were planted, uh, and the plant it, it brought memories for Brooklyn, uh, but it would also harvest in Los Angeles as far as all the relationships and the evolution of Japanese baseball. Uh, because remember, between uh, all of this time, there was only one player, and going back to Chris, it's a giant. Masanori Murakami, 1964 and 1965, yes. only one player from Japan had appeared in the majors, and he wasn't even supposed to appear in the majors. He got called up. He was a single-A pitcher in 64 who had a good year. They brought him up, and suddenly Japanese baseball was like, wait, we didn't expect that. You're not supposed to play in the majors. And there's a fight. He finally goes back to Japan after the 65 season. And so the evolution of Japanese baseball and the relationship to would they want their players to play in the majors, that would also evolve through the decades as well. So on this tour, though, the Dodgers are playing, obviously, some of the better, you know, the, the professional teams in Japan. And there must have been some part of the Dodgers thinking about looking at the Japanese players and going, you know, how, how many of these guys here could possibly make a contribution to a major league team, right? I mean, even that thought 
must have been going through their minds because they started to do these good world tours, right? Oh, so, absolutely. Uh, they had had some exhibition games in Hawaii on the way, and those were lopsided scores. One was 19 to nothing. Um, but these were, um, it, it's interesting with an exhibition game because it's supposed to be fun and, and a goodwill, but then if one side starts to lose and, and I remember when the Dodgers went in 66 and they started losing games and they were sort of grumbling from National League President Warren Giles, hey, you guys are supposed to win these games. And the Dodgers that year in 1956 would play 218 games, wow. uh, the regular season exhibition and everything like that. Uh, so there were a lot of players on that Dodger roster that weren't necessarily household names uh, that got in. They were young players that were on their way up. Uh, but, for example, Sandy Colfax didn't go on the tour. Uh, Sal Magley, who had won 13 games and had a no-hitter uh, that year and helped them win the pennant, he didn't go on the tour. So I'm sure a lot of players uh, were tired. Carl Farrello didn't go on the tour. Um, so, it, it, But the competition, you're, you're right in terms of the quality of Japanese baseball. Um, you could just see it improving, improving, improving. And at that point, fans are wondering, okay, the 60s and 70s, they're thinking, what about Sada Haru O? Oh, what about Nagashima? How would they do in the majors? And when Hank Aaron is hitting all those home runs with the Braves and Sada Haru O oh is hitting 756 home runs and supposedly breaking Aaron's record to 755, okay, how would Sada Haru O oh do in the majors? There are always these distant comparisons, uh, but it really doesn't come to fruition until Nomo in 1995. Right. Well, can we go to the next slide? So besides the baseball games, obviously the, the Dodgers had an opportunity to see other parts of Japan, to maybe experience some of the culture and certainly some of the food. So uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what they're doing here? And Ab Absolutely. They had three, they had not only built in the tour, but they had also given them three days uh, to basically explore the countryside. And uh, Vin Scully is amazing because he can still remember the name of the play when he went into the countryside to see a countryside play. Um, they visited camera shops, uh, pearl diving, restaurants. There were tea ceremonies. Uh, so many photo ops for the press, but then there were so many behind-the-scenes opportunities because the players also, uh, many of them took their wives, and so this was a chance uh, for the wives uh, to be able to enjoy part of the culture, too. It wasn't just play baseball. Uh, it was to be able to have the tea ceremonies, have the... Uh, the kimonos and the special uh, ceremonies and flowers. The one thing that they all commented, they had never seen so many flowers. Uh, and that was such a big deal. Um, just the presentation uh, and everything, the hospitality too, because over 450,000 fans uh, watched these games and uh, they were expecting maybe a half a million for the parade. And they got, quote, only 100,000 because they arrived in a rainstorm. Uh, but just the whole time, it was, you could just tell uh, the excitement that there was. And one of the other keys too, Gil Hodges was acted a little differently in Japan, but in a good way because he was very serious as a player at Ebbets Field and later when he managed the Mets. But he did something that really had an effect on a future executive named Peter O'Malley because Peter O'Malley, the son of Walter O'Malley, was along on the trip. And Gil Hodges would pantomime in the outfield many times and mimic what his players were doing and he got great response from the crowd. If, if he was talking about, you know, uh, Roy Campanella catching, he would make like he's catching and giving signs and everything like that. And Peter never forgot what that was. Even though Gil Hodges didn't speak Japanese, he was immediately the most popular player because he was interacting with the crowd. And that was very, very important because for the next several decades and when Peter becomes president in 1970, um, the international aspect of his job was so important to him. Uh, there were always visitors from around the country, not from around the world, not just Japan, uh, but he always mentioned that Gil Hodges pantomiming, and it was something not a character for him. He was just having fun with the crowd, something he never would have done at Ebbets Field, yet for some reason he felt comfortable enough in Japan uh, to do this with the crowd, and it really had a profound effect on Peter O'Malley. Wow, that's great. Well, we go to the next slide too. This is the memorial at Hiroshima, and there is actually a Dodger Stadium by the elevator, uh, a duplicate plaque. Uh, this was the one that they all talked about in terms of just, um, in, just it, it, the picture speaks for itself as far as um, what, they, what they were there for and the, and the remembrance and everything. 
And it was just a very, very reflective moment uh, for them. And the plaque still at the stadium uh, has all the players' names and, and as far as the dedication and the, uh, the, the prayer that they had and, and everything like that. that. This is the most poignant moment of the 56 tour. Uh, yeah, you, you can see the atomic dome in the background, you know, just on the left side of the picture. It is certainly something that the Japanese themselves, you know, want visitors or, or to all come and visit and stuff. I think the thing that's amazing to me is 1956, right? The war is only 11 years uh, before this, right? And Japan itself, the war devastated most of Japan. And the recovery that they were undergoing at this moment in the 50s into the 60s, and you know, they're already in at this period wanting to host the Olympics in 1964, right? Uh, and, and this is part of that resiliency and things like this. But yeah, I, I always, you know, my, my first visit to Japan, you know, I was taken here as well. And, and, it, and you'll never forget that. It is, it is a, a somber, sobering moment to, to go through this. But I'm glad that this is part of the experience that the Dodgers had even back in 1956. Because and you can notice they're on their way to the game because they're all wearing their shower shoes. Mm. So they're uh, uh, on their way to the game. And this is just uh, something that they had to stop off. Um, I don't think that it would have been as meaningful of a tour had they not made this stop because uh, in reflection, every other player who would talk about this in future years, um, never, whatever influence they had in terms of this was fun, that was fun, um, they all reflected as far as just uh, what a moment it was to be there. And that, that, and your, your point, Chris, as far as the healing, that's why uh, the 49 tour uh, was the first step uh, with the San Francisco Seals in terms of having baseball uh, and giving fans uh, a vehicle, something to, uh, to cheer about again and be able to at least take their minds off of other things and, and focus on the game again. So the other thing is, as you were mentioning, other teams uh, have had taken these tours to Japan. But in some ways, the Dodgers themselves as an organization, you know, were going to establish a relationship with Japan in J Japanese baseball. And so the 56 tour, you know, it ends, you know, uh, 57 is their last season and, and playing in Brooklyn. They moved to uh, Los Angeles in 58, playing the Coliseum. And then eventually in 62, they opened, uh, opened the Dodger Stadium. But what we're going to see now are the interactions, right, of Japanese baseball and the Dodgers at spring training is is that what this is here yeah nothing changed uh that 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 relationship that began in 19 even before 1956 but this is the following spring mm. uh when three members of of the tokyo team come to vero beach uh and you can see sotaro suzuki and he is giving daily reports back to japan uh in terms of seeing american training camp through the eyes of these three players and Newcomb, who was on the cover, he's back with the Dodgers in, in 57. And this is the last uh, Brooklyn Dodger training camp. They'll return in 58 in Vero Beach, but they'll have LA caps. And slowly, the relationship between the Dodgers and the Tokyo Giants, first it's three players in 1957, and then the entire team comes in, in 1961. And then they return in 1967, and then 1971, and then 1975, and then 1982. And along the way, all the relationships, everything, it just becomes uh, it, it, the Dodgers and Japanese baseball uh, really have a partnership. When the stadium opens in 62, uh, the, uh, Mr. Shiriki commissions a lantern uh, to be built commemorating the opening of the ballpark. And it arrived the week that Sandy Colfax pitched the perfect game, September of 1965. And that lantern is still on display at the stadium. Uh, we use it for special community events, um, but there's a photo uh, here where it, where it shows the Tokyo Giants uh, surrounded by the lantern in 1967. And you, re you really, and just think Nomo is still so many years away, <laughs> but all these relationships are setting the stage basically uh, for Nomo in 1995. It's not just that Nomo arrives. Uh, there's a there's a great history of the Dodgers in Japan long before Nomo comes. This is 1967, and the Dodgers are, are hosting the Tokyo Giants, 
and this is the lantern. There was a, a outdoor Japanese garden. It's it's fenced in now. It's beyond the right field, uh, beyond the right field fence. It's still on the property. You can see in the lower uh, left hand corner. There's Mr. O'Malley, and this is uh, uh, one of their trips. And it, it's interesting because Sadaharu O oh is in this picture, and Sadaharu O oh, uh, would visit the Dodgers spring training in in sixty one and sixty seven and seventy one seventy five. Uh, as a guest in 82, but then uh, later when the Dodgers have the International Baseball Classic and then the Olympics, uh, Sada Haru O is still there. And so um, it, all these relationships uh, stretch decades, not just a couple of years. Uh, the, the roots are very deep. That's very much Japanese style, right? Is that before we do business, before we enter into any enterprises together, first, we, 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 we're going to spend the time to get to know each other. Right. And we're going to we're going to build that relationship first and then we'll exactly. think about how we can work together. You are exactly right. And I'd say the O'Malley's uh, own the, the O'Malley family owned the Dodgers from 1950 to 1998. Uh, and even after Mr. O'Malley sold the team in 1998, those relationships continue. Uh, he and his sister, Terry Seidler, uh, famously, as far as writing notes and keeping in touch with people and the holiday cards and everything like that. Uh, the, the Rolodexes and the, and the notes and their relationships have not ended. Um, whether it's the former employees, anybody that they came in contact with, uh, and that includes the Japanese and the international community. So uh, you said it's a, a, a Japanese tradition, but it was also very important to the O'Malley family uh, as far as those, those connections as well. So I think it was a perfect matchup uh, of the Japanese baseball and the O'Malley family. Hey man, what's going on here? Um, I, I do think um, um, we're going to get to some questions now. Um, um, did so, Mark? You know, did the team wear their uniforms whenever they were out in public in Japan, or uh, you know, because we saw them at Hiroshima? But that's because you said they were about to play a game. Yeah, no, they would wear a regular like sport coat and golf shirt and and things like that um so it, whatever the whatever the uh whatever the activity they had clothes for the occasion so uh why, for example when they went to when fred kipp one of the pitchers uh went to a uh, china shop and sent back a set of dishes for his mother in kansas uh mm -hmm. you can see them checking out they're just wearing sport coats and and things like that so i think um it, it remind that photo uh of the hiroshima where they're in their shower shoes uh, it reminds me of what uh, John Suhu did when we went to China in 2008 uh, and just had the players wear the uh, uniform tops uh, for the picture. So, but many times, uh, for example, he also did this at the Coliseum, uh, shot the players in their uniforms. And so in this case, uh, it was just appropriate. They're, they're going to go to the game and you definitely, I think this is a more powerful picture showing Dodger logo uh, and, the, and the Dodger players as opposed to had they been in uh, street clothes and this type of uh, this type of thing, but um, yeah, they, they definitely would wear uh, sport coats if they were going to go rafting. It would be they wouldn't wear the sport coats. It would be more uh, leisure wear, you know, if they were going to get uh, if they were going to get wet. Um, Joy, can we go to the picture with uh, uh, Don Drysdale and Rod Dato? It's it's near the back of the collection. There's you can scroll through these. These are the other uh, tours and things like that. There's Don Drysdale with uh, Mr. Kawakami, and then we want to keep going here because I, I, there's Sadahara O oh with Wes Parker, um, and uh, Steve Garvey and Jim Wynn. Uh, but but there's a, there's a, a, another picture with, that had uh, uh, there this one. Um, I, I I know uh, Mark, you mentioned in a previous conversation with us how important Rod Dato was to international baseball, and I was hoping that maybe you could. Uh, uh, speak a little bit about him. Absolutely. Rod Dato was the USC coach more than 40 years, won the 11 national championships. But what people might not realize, not only was Rod Dato Mr. USC, he was also Mr. International Baseball uh, because he fostered a relationship between uh, USA and Japan. He had gone to Hollywood High, graduates in 1931, had two Japanese-American teammates and throughout his life, he always had the idea as far as what international baseball uh, could be. 
And he was also a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, hurt his back, but he got into a couple games in 1935. And so Dado was the perfect ambassador as far as international baseball. This photo is around 1983, 1984. And with Mr. Shuriki, between Rod Dado and Mr. Shuriki, uh, there's Dr. Frank Job, who had done the famous Tommy John surgery. Uh, Don Drysdale has not yet returned as a Dodger broadcaster, uh, but he's there visiting the Mr. O'Malley on the far left. And so Rod Dado was, was huge in the international community, and it was perfect in 1984 that when baseball finally becomes an Olympic sport, that he was the first manager of Team USA. And uh, ironically, it was, uh, he got his wish. It was Japan and US in the final, in the gold medal game. Uh, the score was not his wish. Japan won the game, uh, but it was a great opportunity to be able to show uh, baseball on a global game. And that 84 Olympic baseball tournament that's still 11 years before NOMO arrives. So uh, we have a, a few more questions here. Uh, Phil Sakamoto is asking, what was the Japanese attitude towards seeing the black players? Were they aware of any racial turmoil in the United States? I don't know as far as what they knew in terms of the racial turmoil in the US. Uh, I just knew the, how famous they were in terms of uh, the famous Brooklyn Dodgers and Jackie Robinson uh, had already been known all around the world. And so I don't think that there was any, um, Jackie actually was more relaxed in Japan uh, than he was barnstorming in a lot of places in the U.S. because the welcome that he got in Japan, uh, he and Rachel just loved it in terms of just being able to see the countryside and the people and everything like that. So uh, Jackie enjoyed the trip tremendously. Uh, and if you think about it, what Jackie you know, would, would endure the rest of his life. He passes away at 53 in 1972. Yeah. Um, a month like that where he can just relax and enjoy himself, uh, I'm sure was few and far between because he had so many causes in the U.S. And Japan was one of the few times that he could just really relax and unwind and just, just take in the sights. So uh, Kenda Hammer asked, did the Dodger players have to adjust to different rules or field sizes or other adjustments playing baseball in Japan? I think the only adjustment they had to do was the travel uh, because, you know, you can think about 19, think about 1958 when the Dodgers play at the Coliseum and you have left field, which is 240 feet away and a, a 40 foot high screen. And so baseball, the baseball players will always tell you, as long as both sides have to play on the same field, then it doesn't matter what the dimensions are. Uh, so there's no famous story in Japan about uh, a pitcher complaining about a short fence or, or any type of ground rule or, or anything like that. Um, there was no, nothing in terms of uh, uniqueness of the ballpark. Uh, I think it was just the travel because uh, it was just, uh, you know, kind of like a campaign tour. You go from city to city to city uh, and you're representing. And there's a famous story about the Dodgers uh, and playing one of the teams and it was they didn't want to play at night because supposedly uh, the energy would cost so much they said one minute of energy will cost us like you know a month and they said hey forget it these fans are not going to leave so you better turn the lights on <laughs> and so maybe logistically the locals uh, had to make some adjustments as far as the the, the size of the crowds and, and having night games uh, but the Dodgers just enjoyed it and played the ball so um Tajiro Don Kanase was asking, you know, since this tour, you know, you, you mentioned that there were obviously other tours by other major league teams, including the Dodgers. Um, has this been something, how long did these tours go on? You know, I, I, I just remember that they would try and get these teams to go after the major league season, and a lot of them were tired and they're beat, and it was not easy to maintain. So, so do, do you know uh, the sort of the parameters of how long these tours uh, kept on going? It started to end in the late 70s. And, and if you remember the big red machine in the Cincinnati Reds, they right. made one of the last trips. Uh, and they go in 1978. And Sparky Anderson was the manager. And he mm -hmm. made sure that the Reds played well and everything like that. Uh, and then a week later, they fired him. They let him go to Japan and, and manage and fire him up and everything. They said, that's great. Uh, now we're going to get a different manager. So he, he never saw that coming. Uh, but what they did was after that in the late 70s, they would have Major League All-Stars come to Japan. Uh, mm. So I can remember after Piazza's uh, big year in uh, uh, 1993, he went to Japan. And so that was the thing to do. Barry Bonds would go there. And so in the early 90s, 
uh, Japanese uh, Japanese would host uh, American uh, All Stars, and then uh, suddenly it changes with uh, uh, with Nomo. It slowly uh, uh, slowly changes, and you didn't have the need for that type tour anymore. You could still have a tour of Japan, but the novelty was off because it was just more see your favorite stars up close. Uh, I remember you know Pui going abroad, uh, but it it wasn't the same as a as an American team coming to Japan. Uh, once Nomo came, then that then that was different in terms of uh, the big question: How would a Japanese player do in the American majors? Well, also too, then you started to have the World Baseball uh, Tournament, which I think is great too. By the way, although it's again, it's hard on all the professionals because they have to uh, make allowances for the time and things like that. But it's a great vehicle, I think, for baseball. Um, Cole Upman wanted to know. He he noticed the Tokyo uh, Yomiuri uniforms you know they look really great but you know they have english on them and i don't know if you uh know this or not mark about when you know uh were they starting to put english on the the, the japanese uniforms and that is a question i don't know yeah i i don't i don't know that either it's interesting uh because in a lot of things you know, you see in japan right they'll put english on things uh and but i, I i'm not sure when that started to happen in in uh in Japan, I mean, th what you were talking about, the fact that Babe Ruth went there, and uh, historically, Japanese Americans were also recruited to play in Japan uh, back in the 30s. There were, there were quite a few of those in those days, so there has always been that relationship. Well, um, the, other th the other thing to consider with the uniforms is once television came along, that's mm -hmm. why we had the red numbers on the front. That was for TV. We were supposed to do that in the 51 World Series, but we got knocked out. And so you had mentioned the sponsors as far as these big corporations sponsoring mm -hmm. the baseball teams. Once these games start to be televised, uh, then that easily could have been a corporate decision as far as we want that logo uh, on the chest. And so that could have been a decision uh, as far as uh, English or Japanese, as far as what to put on the uniform if the camera is going to pick it up. So. I, I know the next program we're going to do, uh, we'll probably talk about this more, but uh, somebody, Glenn, has asked, what were the factors that allowed players in Japan to come and play in America? And obviously, Nomo and Don Nomura are the key to this. The whole key is after the 19... People forget that 1981 season, there's a strike, and Fernando Valenzuela uh, brings joy to everybody, and it was the same thing in 1995. People forget... Uh, that there was a work stoppage that canceled the 1994 World Series. Now, at the same time, Hideo Nomo is having trouble with the Kintetsu Buffaloes on a contract. And his agent, Don Nomura, uh, finally negotiates, uh, Nomo's going to retire. Well, then Kintetsu says, no, he's not going to retire. We're going to release him. And the agent, I'm sure, is saying, thank you very much, because that was the loophole that he needed. And so we didn't have really any scouting reports on Nomo um, A.C. Kuroji, who was in our Asian operations office, he makes a critical phone call to the trainer. He had, A.C. had great connections and he had worked in the Cal League. And A.C. basically asks the trainer, what do you think? And the answer is, it's just tendinitis. And Mr. O'Malley had always wanted to have, just like his father wanted to have a great star from Mexico, mm -hmm. just imagine a possible great star from Japan. And so he takes a, a multi-million dollar flyer on this because... Nobody knows how it's going to work out, but when do you have the opportunity to possibly sign a great pitcher from Japan? And that's how it worked out. Uh, Murakami had to go back in 65. Nomo was released by Kintetsu, and Mr. O'Malley takes a chance, and it was the gamble that paid off because uh, not only the Rookie of the Year, but just culturally changed the landscape. But there was real no mechanism back then in 94, and Nomo really saved baseball back then because – there are so many hard feelings from the work stoppage. He actually signed a minor league contract because he couldn't go to the uh, Vero Beach had he signed a major league contract because it still would have been a work stoppage and major leaguers had been locked out. So by signing a minor league contract, he could put on a different type of Dodger uniform, not as fancy, but work out with the minor leaguers. And finally, uh, when the work stoppage ends, he makes uh, one – rehab start in Bakersfield just to get all tuned up and ready to go. And then he makes that historic debut at San Francisco, which is kind of great because that's where Masanora Murakami was, May the 2nd, 1992, and the rest is history. Yeah, it, it is interesting, the parallels between uh, Fernando and, and, and Nomo in the sense that 
I, I don't know if anyone could have predicted how good both of them were going to be in their initial years with the Dodgers, right? I mean, Fernando, those of us who, are, who remember that thing, it was phenomenal, you, you know, and he was such a sensation. And he did what uh, Mr. O'Malley had hoped for, right, in bringing out uh, his community. And certainly the same thing was true uh, from Nomo. And of course, then, then there's Chen Ho Park. And, you know, I mean, it, it, the door actually really swung open after that in terms of bringing in international players. I think if you look at Fernando, he came out of the blue and he was amazing because he was, nobody expected it. But the thing with Nomo, people forget there was a faction in Japan that didn't necessarily want him to succeed because mm. there were a lot of people that thought maybe they should stay in Japan and uh, not go to, got, go to the majors and somebody trying to buck the system and to do something different. And there was a lot of pushback. And so he had the pressure of the world on him. Uh, Fernando was a pleasant surprise, and, and, but Nomo had total different pressure because uh, to be the first of something like that, um, and especially the pressure, people forget there weren't necessarily everybody rooting for him to succeed, uh, a lot of skeptics, and it was um, even in the, the first inning of his first game, bases loaded, he gets out of it and pitches the five scoreless innings, um, but in spring training and everything like that, um, it was kind of like Jackie Robinson in 1947 in spring training. There was a debate, will this, should this happen? Is this going to even succeed? Can he even compete? And it was the same thing with Nomo. Can he even compete? And obviously after a month, he proved everybody wrong. Yeah, he, he was a revelation. Um, Jonathan Greenberg asked, you know, do you know it, when the Dodgers went on the tour in 56, if any of the players had their own home movie camera? Sometimes you see this home movie footage that uh, professional uh, uh, sports figures have, and they go on a trip like that. Have you heard about anything like that? Yes, Carl Erskine liked to take a movie camera, and he actually went visited a camera shop, and he went there in the morning, and by the end of the day, there was cardboard cutouts of the three players who had visited the camera shop, um, and uh, he, had he had gotten the movies and everything, and so Carl was very good about taking uh, uh, movies, and I'm, I'm sure others did and take, take pictures because they were all given cameras, uh, and the Dodgers had sent along a, a, a photographer, uh, Herb Scharfman, uh, who had shot for Sports Illustrated and, and along with um, Barney Stein took so many famous photos and later John Suhu would, would uh, be the guy in Los Angeles. Um, but they all had their own cameras. And so uh, there are many pictures uh, and videos I'm sure that the, the players have of their own. And then at the end of the tour, just like in 66, uh, the players were given albums uh, from the newspaper uh, mm -hmm. very elaborate albums and boxes as far as a thank you gift. And so uh, that's something that they all cherish. They, all those guys uh, cherish their albums because uh, there's like 40 pages in each album. Uh, and then in 93, when we went to Japan, it was Suhu the one that did it. Suhu made the album uh, for all the players. Oh, that's great. Uh, David Fujioka wanted to know if he knew if, if the Dodger – uh, players had any opportunity to interact with uh, young people in Japan, youth in Japan on their tour? Definitely, because any type of goodwill tour uh, includes clinics, includes visits to schools and everything like that. Um, even before the Dodgers came, um, when they were stuck in uh, Wake Island, they were stuck there for like eight hours while they're trying to refuel. And Wake Island just called it a holiday. And Roy Campanello remembered spending all the time with the kids at the airport. And so that's natural. That's something that you love to do uh, on tours. Uh, and that's just a natural thing. So every single day there would have been interaction, uh, interaction with fans. It wouldn't have been. Uh, they, I'm sure at the end of the tour they were very tired, but it was a very good tired because of all the people uh, that they got to meet. And the thing that you're going to want to do is definitely hang out with kids because you never know what uh, – uh, what they're going to get off of something like that. And I still, I can remember 2008 in Japan, uh, no, in China, um, the most memorable moment I saw was a, a mother taking her son, couldn't have been more than five years old, wearing a ball cap. And I just wondered, what is he thinking? He's going to a ball game in, in China. What memories is he going to remember from this? Because he just had a look of wonder. But that's a universal look. Uh, so we have so many of those photos from 56 as far as the players interacting uh, with young kids. Oh, that's great. So, uh, John Baker uh, heard you say that Vin Scully was on the tour. Uh, she wants to know 
Uh, was he there to work? You know, did he announce some of the games? He didn't announce the games. He was actually a correspondent for Sport Magazine. Oh my God. So he wrote an essay and he also took pictures. And so uh, just imagine Vin Scully on assignment, uh, yeah. taking photos and doing a travelogue uh, for uh, Sport Magazine. And I'm, th there wouldn't have been any play-by-play, -play, but I'm sure since he was such a, a integral part of the, uh, and he was the lead announcer, um, he uh, would have been everywhere. Uh, but there was no, he, I, it was a chance for him to do something else. So he could just take pictures and, and write correspondence. And, and later, I believe it's 1957, the February issue, uh, Vin did a great big essay. And the money that he got for doing the sport magazine, he actually uh, took a, a, a steamship back and uh, uh, he went back a different way. He didn't fly back. He took his sport magazine money and jumped on a on a cruise ship and went back uh, went back that way to uh, to visit other uh, areas. And he also, I believe, he that's the trip that he went to Italy with the O'Malley's. And his famous story that Anne Branca was there, and you're not supposed to talk to the Pope when you meet the Pope. <laughs> but she asked. There's a group of six people, and she asked for blessings on the family. And so she the Pope gives. And so by the time he gets to Scully, he's all excited because he's going to tell his mother that he's met the Pope. And all the Pope says to Vin Scully, he points to the Brancas and says, are you with them? And he just nods his head, yeah. <laughs> so that was his Pope story. I'm with them. So the amazing Vin Scully, one of the treasures of L the LA sports scene. We are so lucky here in Los Angeles. We had Chick Hearn, right? We had Dick Enberg, Don Drysdale. We had Vin Scully. Uh, it's just, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Al Michaels started here. Um, so Carrie Kababa asked an interesting question. It's a little bit elaborate, but she said her late father, who I think she's talking about Jack Kunitomi, uh, said that he had a friend after the war who helped redesign the Japanese stadium sets to be more comfortable for the larger foreigner anatomy. In other words, I guess probably the seats. Did you hear anything about that sort of thing? Now, is that, is that for the... Uh uh, at Dodger Stadium or in Japan? No, I, th I think it sounds like it, she's talking about Japanese stadiums uh, that, that maybe that, that they were somehow able to influence how the foreigners, because, you know, Japanese people in general yeah. are smaller. I haven't heard that. I heard in 62 the dugout seats uh, made it frustrating for Milton Berle because he wanted to run around and, <laughs> be, and be Milton Berle, and they finally had to tell him after that first week, you know, please stay in your dugout seats, and, and this is not your Friars Club uh, uh, <laughs> mixer, you know, National League rules. For, so even though the dugout seats were close, they were a little too close in, in, for, uh, uh, for people wanting to keep Milton Berl in his seat. <laughs> Uncle Milty. A, that's, that's what happens, right? Let's see. Uh, so so uh, Steve, I think it's Katich, asks, what is the relationship between Major League Baseball and Japanese professional baseball today? Well, it's the relationship that you'd have with any, uh, as far as Korea and, and anything else. Uh, you have players going back and forth. And so if you're going to sign somebody from a team, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a way to do it. Uh, it's not just the uh, wild free agency. There had to be a system. And so when, when Ichiro comes along, by that time, there's a posting system. And mm -hmm. so major league teams would make uh, blank bids. And so... Uh, it evolves, and whatever the negotiations are between the players' association and the commissioner's office, and then whatever the association of the other of the other uh, country. For example, we're not going to sign a Kenta Maeda if he's not eligible to be signed. It's the mm -hmm. same with Otani, uh, who later went to the Angels. Um, they that Japanese league has to be on board with how they want to release players, and so they have to secure the release or their permission from their federation, we're, the Angels aren't just going to sign an Otani uh, without the blessing of the Japanese professional league. You couldn't do that. So um, that's the relationship, especially when you have uh, the player movement between, Amer between the United States and Japan. Uh, so many players going back and forth. Those federations have, have to have the agreement. How are we going to do this? So there's uh, no litigation or any problems like that. That's why it was a key with Murakami. He could have stayed. And the Giants could have forced the hand and said, no, you can't play in Japan. You're under contract with us. And 
the cooler heads prevailed and they realized it was a unique situation. So that was the compromise. You play in 65 and then, and then you'll go back in 66. Yeah, Murakami's situation was very, very unique, right? Because he, it, my understanding is, I read Robert Fitz's book on Murakami and, and essentially, you know, that what was happening was Japanese baseball was sending their prospects to play in, the, in, in American minor league programs, never thinking yeah. that, what, you know, some of them would ever get called up to the majors, right? Absolutely. And, and the Giants, I think, had a couple of injuries. And like you said, Murakami was having a good year. And, and, you, and, and, and that's a universal need. No matter what country you're in, you always need pitching, especially a good lefty in the bullpen. Yep. Yep. And he did well. And as you know, uh, as you know, Mark, you and I talked a little bit before the, this program, I remember that because in the, the 1960s, the only games that the Dodgers would televise were the Giants game up, up in San Francisco. And so back in the 60s, you know, 66 and around then, we used to see those games. And here comes Murakami out of the Giants bullpen. And it's this you know, all of us in, in, our, in our Nikkei community, you know, down here as Dodger fans, we had this mixed feeling about that we wanted to do him to do well, but not against the Dodgers, <laughs> you know, it, it was, a, it was, a, it was an interesting period, you know, and then, and then when he just disappeared, right, when he, it, he was doing well, and then he went back to Japan. Yeah, and then he tries to make a comeback with the Giants, I think around 1982 at age 39, and just didn't have it in spring training, mm -hmm. uh, but how history might have changed because the Dodgers won the pennant by only two games in 65 and the Giants finished uh, second four consecutive years. Uh, so you, you just never know. Uh, but that was something that uh, uh, Murakami had to make that decision and the Giants uh, and Major League Baseball. That's the case of them all having to get together and say, how are we going to how are we going to do this? Mm -hmm. um See, we have another question. Uh, Bridget Reach says, there was a mention of a Dodger organization presence in Japan today. Is, is, is there a formal uh, Dodger relationship with any of the, the, the baseball teams or a presence in, J in Japan by the well, Dodgers? We, we, throughout the years, we've had relationships as far as either, not necessarily working agreements, but either friendship agreements or uh, uh, alliances, nothing that can control players, but uh, there's various goodwill back and forth. And even in the 90s, um, Scott Akasaki, who is now our traveling secretary, he actually spent a year in Japan right. when the Dodgers opened an office in Japan. And just think, you know, how progressive that was in terms of just that, that type of thinking. Um, so it just goes back to your comment, Chris, about the relationships. Um, there's always the relationships back and forth because um, you just never know down the road in terms of what, uh, what might happen. And it's interesting, too, that the Chunichi Dragons, that D that we have as our, our alternative cap, uh, the Dragons took that from us. Yeah. And, and then, well, hey, it worked out. Now we have it. Uh, and they have the Dragons uh, script, just like the Dodger script that originated in 1938. Um, so it's funny. When, then years pass. And that D hat is going to be so popular with kids here in, in Southern California, they would have no idea that uh, uh, the Chunichi Dragons uh, took that, you know, in the, in the 1980s as far as their look. I, I personally am, like, because I am a baseball fan, I have been all my life, I just love this stuff. I, I love hearing this stuff. Uh, there is so much here, uh, you know, just, you know, you do a ho show about Jackie Robinson, obviously, the relationship of the Dodgers in Japan. That, that What I didn't realize until this program is the influence Japan had on Dodger Stadium, um, the lantern that exists out in Dodger Stadium, you know, all, all those years in relationship, and obviously the O'Malley's themselves. Um, one of the things I, I mentioned to you, Mark, before is what I always admired about the O'Malley's is when they moved here in 58, uh, Mr. O'Malley was very much open to welcoming all the communities of Southern California to become Dodger fans, including uh, the Nikkei community, the Japanese American communities. And, you know, I think he might have been one of the first around to have these days that were dedicated to either groups, churches, whatever, right? I mean, he was very, very good about those kinds of things. But, but I just remember as a kid going to the Coliseum or going to Dodger Stadium, and you always felt welcome. 
right? They, the Dodgers always welcomed everybody who wanted to be a Dodger fan. And that was so important, I think, to uh, the fabric of what Southern California was. And it also showed me how important a sports team could be to the civic betterment, you know, the, the well-being of any community. And the Dodgers were really, to me, one of the best at that, if not the best, uh, growing up here in Los Angeles. You're exactly right. I went to my first game when I was seven, and that was 47 years ago, 48 years ago. But I remember it like it was yesterday. And the, the Sundays in the pavilion and everything like that, um, those are the memories that you cherish. And, and this, this season, this is why it's been strange, because we've been so accustomed to so many things. And I was, I was thinking, reflecting when we lost to Washington in the playoffs and, and Charlie Steiner in the 10th inning had announced, this will be the worst loss since 1951. And <laughs> what you realize is now you realize and look back, actually a full ballpark and everything like that, that was the best of times. And so you just have to savor, you're exactly right as far as the first couple months taken away and suddenly no baseball. And you suddenly might be able to appreciate what a Brooklyn fan had to go through in 1958 when suddenly your team is gone. And what are you going to do? This routine that we've taken for granted, now we're going to cherish it as it starts up again. Because I think it's an amazing stat. First time with no baseball in 130 years at Memorial Day. Um, yeah. We just have to savor uh, these institutions. But also, you're exactly right as far as what a major league team or any team uh, can mean to a community, but especially the Dodgers and especially Southern California. Yeah, I mean, honestly, baseball, because it's such a – long season it is like life it is a part of you when it starts up in april and if you're lucky you make it into october and 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 that's what's so important that's why these kinds of programs are so good so i i think it's it's a little after seven i know we're supposed to end i i wanted to thank mark uh, langell he is every time i talk to mark i learn something and it's on a subject that I think I know something about, so it's fantastic. He's very generous with his time and, and sharing this. Uh, we're going to be doing another program in July, and I think that'll be equally fun for all of us. Um, otherwise, I think we're going to sign off on, on the program, and I have no technical knowledge on what to do about this. But maybe Joy can actually take, take, take uh, sign us off here. <laughs> You're right, Chris. I have no technical knowledge. I have the baseball knowledge. Joy, thank you very much. Chris, thank you very much. And thank you for everyone uh, who tuned in tonight. Yep. Well, I don't have the baseball knowledge, so this all works out well. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. I learned so much today, and I'm just grateful um, that we could have this conversation. Um, and yes, as we mentioned, um, we do have another program on July 10th uh, with some familiar faces and then some new faces. So definitely um, check that out. I put the link in the chat. And then I'm also going to put the link right now to a survey. And if you can fill that out, if you are here today, that would be so helpful in helping us continue to put on programs like this, continue to improve. And if you enjoyed what you saw today, also I hope you consider supporting Janum and donating, maybe become, becoming a member um, and getting access to programs like like this. Um, and so thank you so much again for coming. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chris. Um, this will be available online later. But um, yeah, this was a really wonderful evening. And I hope everyone has a good night. Stay safe. Okay. Stay safe. See you later, Mark. See you later, Joy. Thank you. Stay safe.